many discussions about behavioral interventions, and I firmly believe that no pharmacological interventions should take place unless the behavior is right as well. So we work alongside psychologists, and we work very hard, but at times we do need to prescribe medications to help reduce some of the more challenging problems in this group of children. And I want to talk about a software system as well for monitoring changes in a safe way that allows us to look at this experience. One second. So, many times, as you will know, it's not the core Asperger's syndrome that's the problem. It's the comorbidities that accompany it so much of the time. The anxiety, the aggression, obsessions and compulsions, depression and other mood disorders, hyperactivity, We've just finished looking at this again in a survey, and it's 30%. It's always been 30%. Um, sleep disorders, which we spoke about. Tics and Tourette syndrome, very commonly comorbid. And so really, it's those areas that we often need to address. And it's interestingly, it's those areas that are sometimes the ones that are more amenable to psychopharmacological treatments than the core symptoms, which are very difficult to change. Now, for a parent, the difficulty is looking on the internet because there is millions of sites with information and it's not always correct information. And so as a professional, I have a family who will arrive with five inches of notes. They put it on my desk. What do you think of that? And I go, I don't know. So it's very difficult to separate the important research from the stuff that is not important and shouldn't change our practice. We need to know with pharmacological treatments if it works. And we need to know if it works, how well does it work in general? How well does it work compared with placebo? Or how well does it work compared with the interventions that we are already using, not just on its own? We need to know if it's safe. And we also need to know if it's going to be safe for the group of patients that we see that's not always the same as a group of patients that's been discussed in a paper or in a clinical trial. So it's very hard pulling apart the important papers from the non-important ones. So this was a paper talking about using secretin to treat autism, and it caused a lot of controversies, and it was claimed to be discovered by a mother. It Finally, there were randomized control studies comparing intravenous, you'll all know this story, it's an old story now, comparing intravenous saline, salt water, with intravenous secretin. So it was, it was only when there was a placebo, the saline, that the, we could interpret the studies, which showed us that saline was marginally better than secretin. Secretin had no effect. Okay. So some of the lessons. You can't read? Okay. The key is to look at the numbers in any study that's quoted... If it's less than 60, there are statistical reasons why it's going to be difficult to judge any change at all. You need to see if the population that's been chosen represents your population. And you need to calculate some way of saying, how beneficial is this treatment? In the UK, we use the number needed to treat. And it might be something that you're familiar with. Um, and use all the time. Some papers quote it and others don't. Um, it is a measure of the percentage of the patients that get better on treatment compared with the percentage that get measured on, better on, with placebo. And it tells you how many children or how many young people you'd need to give this medicine to to make one of them better. And we can reverse it and talk about the number needed to harm. How many young people 
would you need to give this medication to before one had a serious side effect? The reason I like this measure is because parents understand it really well as well. And any decision about pharmacology needs to involve the whole family in a way that they can understand. And so we always would quote the number needed to treat and the number needed to harm. So let's talk about some of the symptoms. Some symptoms are pretty medication responsive. And these are things like hyperactivity, obsessions, and ritualistic behavior. Ticks can be responsive to medication, as can challenging behaviors. The second group, ag aggression, anxiety, depression, impulsivity. Behavior usually works best. And a modified CBT, we find, usually works better than medication. Sometimes you need both. And finally, it's important to realize that so many of the social deficits are not going to be improved by medication. There's no evidence yet that we have anything that alters the core symptoms. So we try and target different behaviors. And I'm going to start off, I'm only going to talk about two areas of behavioral treatment due to time. I'm going to talk about challenging behaviors. This might be aggressive behaviors. This might be self-injurious behaviors. Okay, um, And I'll be talking about where that little character comes from as well. So risperidone is a medication that's been used quite a lot for challenging behaviors. And I want to use it as an example to demonstrate how we use number needed to treat and number needed to harm. This was the original trial, looking at the clinical global inventory, those children that did have risperidone and those children that didn't. And, it, and that trial on its own would not be easy to show to a parent and say, there, make a decision. OK? What we really want to do is to be able to say, every decision is a balance. We might do good, we might do harm. OK? We need to treat two children who've got challenging behaviors with risperidone to make them better, to make one better. We need to treat four children. By the time we've treated four, we will cause a serious side effect in one of them. And so I hope you can see that, and that's simply based on the figures and the evidence from the literature, that in that way, a clinician a young person and a family can make a real decision about whether they want to go to that stage to take the risk of side effects. How bad is the behavior? <coughs> so you'll know that the long-term problems with risperidone include weight gain, difficulties with raised prolactin, metabolic effects, and some of the other atypical neuroleptics um, so olanzapine, if you wanted to compare that with risperidone, you can use the same thing. The number needed to benefit there is 3.3, so it's not working as well. And the number needed to harm is 2.17. So automatically and very easily you can see far more chance of side effects, which tend to be obesity, and so risperidone is used more. And long term, the trials with risperidone have shown that it maintains its efficacy even over one year, period. But the difficulty is that it's very important for these medicines not to be used instead of getting the right behavior, instead of getting the right environment. We use them to just take the edge off to reduce problem behaviors enough to then let the environment and the behavioral manipulations work. That's telling us about the weight gain. Anticonvulsants, which are sometimes used for challenging behaviors, have a very poor evidence base. And I can talk about this afterwards with people that want to, but I don't think we should be using either sodium valparate or carbamazepine to treat challenging behaviors um, in children with Asperger's and autism. There's no evidence that it works. So the next one, hyperactivity. Um, 30% rate in children with Asperger's syndrome of ADHD-type symptoms. And many of you will be aware of the fact that um, presenting symptoms change. So you'll often, a parent will say, well, they told me that he had ADHD when he was five years old and treated him for that, but now he's eight 
and he's having problems with integration in school, and he's having social difficulties and obsessional behaviors, and it becomes obvious, more obvious, that there was a comorbidity, a combination that just presented at different times. So this is now the group of children that have comorbid ADHD and Asperger or autistic spectrum problems. We know looking at methylphenidate. So methylphenidate, Ritalin, which is the main medication used um, for ADHD on its own. There's been a good study looking at this in children with autism and Asperger's syndrome. And let's have a look. The number needed to benefit was two. So you treat two children who have ADHD comorbid with this medication and you'll help one of them. But the number needed to harm is, is low, 1.6. So it seems that children with Asperger's and autism are more sensitive to side effects of these medications than other groups of children and young people. We need to be careful about that. I'm not going to talk about the other medications. I'm going to try and talk to you about why I think computers can be helpful in the long-term monitoring. Because our problem now is we understand about Asperger's and we understand about all the comorbidities. We understand that a range of treatments can be helpful, both behavioral and pharmacological. But how do we capture all that over time to allow us to decide what's helping in an individual? So computers can be good at asking sensitive questions, all right? Because in studies of HIV and sexual behaviors, people will tell a computer more honestly than they'll tell a psychologist or a doctor. We know that computers can interview members of school who might not come to clinic, but you want to capture what they have to say. And we know that if you're careful, a computer can have a bedside manner. A computer can be sensitive to interactions in a way that makes someone want to continue. So we spent four years, and this was um, Professor Gilly Baird that some of you might have heard of, myself and Dr. Paramala Santosh, in developing a multimedia scale that children as well as parents could use that would allow us to monitor behaviors across all the symptoms we're talking about over time and quite easily. And we had very good animators helping with the design. We had focus groups of children saying, that image is rubbish, that looks nothing like what you think it does. And we had actors doing the voiceover. It had to feel very real. So there's now this system called Health Tracker, healthtracker.co.uk. Um, it was funded by a charity in the UK. There's been no pharmaceutical involvement at all. I've not received any pharmaceutical money in relation to this. Um, and it's just important when anyone tells you about research now for you to ask that question. So children and parents can go onto this site just on the internet from their home, from their school, from a library or from clinic. And I want to take you through an example of how children... Um, so there are different modules. There are ones for the younger children, I'll start with. There are ones for um, the adolescents, and I'll show you those as well, because they're obviously different. And the way that children respond to a questionnaire is not by giving them a Connors questionnaire, it's by telling them a story. Children respond to a narrative. And they want a choice in that narrative. They want to know about a character and to be able to choose a character as well. So we had to use stories, narratives, and we had to use characters as well. Um, so I'll just let this example of a child play. Now, because of the audio system, I have to bend the microphone down to my laptop, and I hope you can hear Choose player selection. Choose me. Pick me. Pick me. Pick me. Hi, I'm Talia. Okay, now choose your skateboard move for this player. Hi. 
Okay. Just click Start if you already know how to do this. Check out my skateboard ramp. The training module that you'll see has enabled four-year-old children to do this on their own without any adult intervention. So it seems slow, but children understand it. Always. Do you think you can do this without a grown-up? Let's say I never get tired during the day. Can you click on never for me? No, try again. Let's say I never get tired during the day. Can you click on never? Great! Now, let's say, I sometimes get tired during the day. Can you? Great! Last one now. I know this is boring, but we are nearly ready to begin. Let's say I always get tired during the day. Can you? Great! Okay, it looks like you've got the hang of this. Let's get started. Come with me to school first. So this is a transition, a day in the life of this I child, and some of the quality of life I'm questions. With your friends. Sometimes. I enjoy school. Do you enjoy school? Always. I enjoy playground games. Do you enjoy playground games? Sometimes. It's break time now. Come with me out to the playground. I have lots of energy. Do you have lots of energy? Sometimes. And now some of the sim some of the side effects we want to capture. I lose my appetite and do not feel very hungry. Do you ever lose your appetite? Never. Let's go to the park on the way home. And now some of the some symptoms as well. Do you ever worry about your weight? Sometimes I really worry about things being just right and have to do the same thing over and over again. Do you worry about things being just right? Sometimes. I sometimes feel really sad. Do you ever feel really sad? Is this one tricky? Take your time. Quite. Oh. <coughs> okay, so you saw different components, a bit of the because the time delay is built in, so it gives it a human feel, and we're able to capture symptoms, side effects, and quality of life from their home frequently, and it goes straight onto a database in the computer, and we can share the results with them instantly in clinic. And the children have said they like being asked how they feel, and a boy with um, Asperger's syndrome said to us, I feel I can tell the cartoons how things are going. I don't feel nervous or rushed, which was really interesting to hear. It has uh, many neuropsychological games as well that are actually measuring things like working memory, reaction time, um, sustained attention. And um, so those, again, can be done sort of remotely. Um, I'm just going to show you how... I'm going to show you how a sort of a clinic feedback session can, can now go, um, if it works. Oh. 
It's worth looking at um, where we sort of came from before we started the medication and whether anything's sort of been improved. Because as you remember, um, Rihanna was scoring really highly here for um, hyperactivity, she's running around the place. And concentration was a major difficulty. If we look at what happened last week, um, there's been a deterioration. She's off her food and sleep has got worse. I'm afraid that these are significant enough to affect... I'll show you the feedback in more detail, but we can communicate with general practitioners, with families, all have the same information across symptoms and side effects. The teenagers... The adolescents need a different type of questionnaire, and this is what they have, a bit like um, the Apple iPod logo, I'm not supposed to say that, um, about their quality of life. Parents have questionnaires, and these are measuring impact of looking after these children on the whole family. And listening to carers, we've had feedback, we don't have to come to hospital as often. It's got a real bedside manner. We like to see the progress. Parents and children really like to see the results themselves. Compliance, the, um, the willingness to continue taking a medication or the willingness to continue carrying out a behavioral intervention is a crucial factor in whether things we do work. And in this case, if you can look at a graph and see the improvement over the last two years, and where you started off, it's easy to forget where you started off, it encourages people to carry on with treatments. So this is how we would feed back, for example, post-methylphenidate, we'd say, well, these areas have improved, hyperactivity, inattention, but unfortunately, some areas have got worse, self-injuries got worse, child's lost appetite, and it's taken them longer to fall asleep. And so, very quickly, we're sharing benefits with parents and adverse effects, and we're making a joint decision on whether we should carry on. And the last two slides are just, we looked at this to see whether in children who had ADHD and autism, um, the comorbidity would make a difference to how they responded to methylphenidate and a difference to the side effects. Quite complicated um, pictures, I'm afraid, but all I basically wanted to show is that there was a significant improvement for the group treated just with ADHD and for the group treated with ADHD and autism, and it was using this same tool, improvements in hyperactivity, oppositional behavior, and aggression, interestingly. We went on, and we had more difficulty demonstrating that there was a change in low mood um, and interestingly, some of the cognitive rigidity, the um, insistence on sameness, seeing things black and white, seemed to get worse in some of the children as well. So using a system like this, we pick up the things that work well, but the things that we might be making worse without realizing. And so this system is now being used across a lot of areas of pediatrics and adult medicine to monitor change. It's not a magical diagnostic system. We don't, I don't like online systems that help people make a diagnosis because I believe a diagnosis needs a multidisciplinary team and needs to be done properly. But it is a convenient way to measure change and capture and record it across populations or individuals. Um, and so I'm going to finish there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. Um...